our Bibles to the book of Daniel. We're going to go ahead and get started with an introduction to our course of study in the book of Daniel. The theme and message of the book of Daniel is articulated clearly in chapter 4 of that book. So let's look at Daniel chapter 4 briefly as we get started. In Know Your Bible Introductions, I provide an introduction to every book in the Bible, of course, including Daniel. And in that introduction, you'll have a lot of background information that would be useful to you and helpful to you in your study as we proceed. And that's why I include that book with, I think you got that with, uh, you know, you might not have, not just now thought of that. You got Know Your Bible Investigations, the book of Revelation, chapters 1 to 3. But I'm not sure if I included in that set Know Your Bible Introductions. That's, you probably have it, though. If you've been around here for very long at all, I'm sure you have it. If not, you can get it by going online and uh, downloading that, uh, that PDF. It's free to anybody who's participating in any of our studies. All right, or Daniel chapter 4, then. The Bible says in verse 17, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the Lord, uh, excuse me, by the word of the Holy Ones, to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. That's where basis of men can refer to persons of low degree, but it really is not a word that's used, this one anyway, is not the word that's used to speak of those who are of low character. It does speak, however, of those who are of low degree. David would be one of those base men that was elevated to a king, uh, to a kingdom. He was uh, a shepherd out in the fields and the flocks, and he was a, a lowly shepherd kind of thing. He was a base man in that regard. We tend to think of the word as meaning of ill repute or of low character, and that is actually not the word that's translated base here. So, uh, in any of it, I just thought I'd clarify that. The point is, the uh, book of Daniel is about this great truth, that God rules over the kingdom of men, and he gives it to whomever he will. Now, that interesting word, it, um, is singular, so it didn't say them. It doesn't say he's, uh, he rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to whomever he will. This particular, now that's true, he does, that's said elsewhere, but this is talking about the fact that God gave the, there's a kingdom called the kingdom of man. And that's, in, that's comprehensive of all mankind. And that God gives that kingdom to whomever he will. He puts it under the power and authority of whomever he chooses. And in the case of the time that Daniel wrote his prophecy that happened to be, or much of his prophecy, that happened to be a man named Nebuchadnezzar. But more on that, as we proceed, let's go ahead and um, I need a little extra table space here. I forgot to mention that when we, anyway. So is Pastor Sanchez, Pastor Sanchez is busy this morning with, yeah, that's right, he's filling in for someone. So um, I'm not sure how I'm going to make this work. A chair would be helpful, anything, something I can lay my Bible on where I could see it would be nice. I think, uh, I think Brother George is going to get us a table. No, that's okay, Jim. I think Brother George is going to get me a table. That would be better because it'd be higher. But thank you. I just, it might, my bad. I forgot to mention that when I'm doing this, I need to have another table here. We used to set that up, and I forgot to mention it. So, all right. Hey, there we go. That's the table I was looking for. <laughs> thank you, Brother George. Appreciate that. All right, excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so now all things are good. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as you know, of course, never mind. Let's go ahead and get going. <laughs> the prophet Isaiah, open your Bible to Isaiah and find chapter 46. Let's look at verses 9 and 10. Isaiah the prophet. I don't know who took this photograph of Isaiah, but I appreciate it. <laughs> I think this gentleman has stood in for Isaiah, for Elijah, for Jeremiah, for 
<laughs> so, but anyway, today he's Moses. I, I'm sorry, Moses. Today he's Isaiah. But anyway, uh, the prophet Isaiah said, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet come, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, 9 to 10. And that verse tells us that anything we're going to know about the future comes from God. God is the one who knows the end from the beginning. And he is the only one who knows the end from the beginning. We need to be mindful of that. So this is your course introduction. The course text for this study is called The Visions of Daniel. If you do not already have a copy of this course text, you can go to Santa Maria Lighthouse. In fact, you can do that right now. You can get online uh, right where you're seated if you wanted to. Or if you're watching my Facebook, you can go online right now to santamarialighthouse.org. You can click on the registration menu button at the top right of the menu bar just above the little slideshow you'll see there. And uh, then scroll down to where it says uh, Daniel and Revelation course registration. Click on that. Complete the form. Send it. You'll get an email that will include this text, a PDFI of this text. For those of you who have already received the PDFI, you've already registered and you have that PDFI, I sent out a new one. If you did not get it, let me know. But I sent out an updated version of the Visions of Daniel. This one is more complete. Now, we got a couple of more ver versions before I'm completely done and ready to go to press with it. But right now... It's not a good place. You can, it's all fully interactive. If you go to the table of contents, for example, you can go to whatever portion of the book you want, click on it, it'll take you immediately to that portion of the book. It has an index now, a complete index, which is helpful. So you can go into the index, and if you see what you're looking for, you can click on the page number, and boom, you'll go straight to the page. So we're getting there, slow but sure. But PDF, the PDF for the Visions of Daniel is available now, and it's fully interactive with hyperlinks and all that kind of good stuff. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I already said that. You'll receive an email with links to download. Also, Know Your Bible Investigations, Revelation Part 1, and The Visions of Daniel. You'll get both of those texts when you register for the class. There are four things that you need to know. And there's one person that you need to meet. Let's talk about the four things that you need to know. The first thing you need to know is this. I believe the Bible the whole Bible, and so far as authority is concerned, only the Bible is our source of authority. So the Bible, the whole Bible, and I only hesitate to say nothing but the Bible because we do look at other books, and there are things said in other books that are truthful. So, But when it comes to authority, when it comes to our sole source of inspired revelation, it's only the Bible. That's very important. I believe the Bible is inspired. What does that mean? It means it's God-breathed. We're going to be going through a series. We, are, we have begun a series on Sunday nights called Hermeneutics, uh, how to interpret the Bible, the art and science of interpreting the Bible. And we'll next be going into the whole question of the Bible we interpret. And I'll be talking about the doctrine of inspiration, the doctrine of inerrancy, the, the doctrine of preservation. Here we're only going to summarize just as an upfront statement of what we believe and to correctly orientate the students to this particular study. We're not going to be appealing to the prophecies of Gene Dixon. Some of you know who I'm talking about. We will not be digging into the prophecies of Nostradamus. We're not going to be looking into any of that stuff. The Houdini wrote a few things that some people think are prophetic. We won't be consulting Houdini. Can't find him. Never mind. <laughs> the point is, we're going to be looking at the Bible. The Bible is the source of authority and the source of information for us. And I believe the Bible is inspired. That means it's God-breathed. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, the Bible says. All right? 2 Timothy chapter 3.16. All Scripture 
is given by inspiration of God. That means God breathed out. And so I'll, I'll go further into that in my study on Sunday nights. The next thing about the Bible we need to remember is this. It's been preserved. The Bible's been preserved. The Bible promises us that. In Psalm 12, we're told that God has made a commitment to preserve his words from this generation forever. Now, some people have absurdly interpreted that to mean that God's going to keep his words from that generation. The Bible tells us that God intended his words to be for every generation. <laughs> so that's an, it's an awkward way to interpret that passage, but it is a way to get around the obvious portent of that passage. That passage tells us that God has made a commitment that he will preserve what he gave by inspiration. All that God gave by inspiration, he supernaturally preserved for us so that I believe the Bible has been preserved in the King James Version of the Bible. The King James Bible, I believe, is the perfectly preserved words of God. Now, that's something we go into in great detail in our Sunday night series, and I'm looking forward to um, sharing all that information with you at that time. But this is just like, for the record, this is a Bible study. Second, the second thing you need to know of the four things I want you to know is this. While I have earned four degrees from a THG all the way through a doctorate in theological studies, my dependency is upon the teacher that Jesus provided for us, the Holy Ghost. The, Jesus promised us that when the Spirit has come, when the Holy Ghost has come, the Comfort has come, He will guide you into all truth. And He said in John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. So we, we trust and depend upon the Holy Spirit of God to help us understand the Scriptures as we study them. So guided by Him, I approach this study believing the Bible is the only absolute authority. Believing the Bible is a complete revelation of all that God has for us in the churches today and believing the Bible is a perfect revelation of all that God has for us in the churches today. And so believing the Bible written by God was written with perfect precision. I'll be emphasizing that from time to time as we proceed through our study. It's important to understand many of the conclusions that I take from Scripture come from an examination of the text with a belief that it's written with a perfect level of precision. Now, again, in our hermeneutics course that we're teaching on Sunday nights, I will go into that and show you when we study how the apostles interpreted the Old Testament. How did Jesus handle the Old Testament? We'll show you that they set the example of studying the scriptures with a complete dependency on the precision of the language. And there's one powerful illustration that I use often. You probably have used, heard me use it before, but bear with me as I throw it out there again. You might remember the story when the Sadducees came to Jesus and challenged him on the doctrine of the resurrection. And he said, you, and they said something about uh, there were seven uh, men that had the same wife and each died without leaving any children. So in the resurrection, whose wife will she be? And Jesus said, you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. He, he explained that in the resurrection, there's no husband and wife. That relationship is over. Sorry, guys. It's just the way it is. Wives, too. Everybody you know, feels like they're going to be married forever all the way into heaven. Doesn't work that way. <laughs> we'll be as the angels uh, being then persons who are not who do not marry nor are given in marriage but then he goes on to say he tells us have you not read the bible says god speaking i am the god of abraham isaac and jacob and then jesus said he is the god of the living not the dead the sadducees blinked twice maybe four times and thought wow that completely undid their whole theology because they would say all the time, God is the God of the living, not the dead. God is the God of the living, not the dead. There's no resurrection. God is the God of the living, not the dead. Jesus took their own little saying, turned it around on them and said effectively, that is true. He said, since that's true, have you noticed? God said, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not I was, but I am. 
And that indicated that they were yet alive. Even though they had died in the flesh, they were yet alive. And so, what's the point I'm making with this? Jesus rested the weight of his argument on the tense of a verb. It's because God said, I am the God. He drew from that, this conclusion. On, on the authority of the tense of that verb, God is presently the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. My point there is that when Jesus studied the Bible, which is a little bit interesting in itself since he is the word, okay, and he is, of course, the originator of all the words from eternity past. Nevertheless, when Jesus read the Old Testament, he who wrote it showed to us that it's written with absolute precision. So when I put a lot of emphasis on the fact that the word that is used here or the word of means this or when I look close at this or that verb, especially the verbs, when I do that kind of work and examine a text critically, and I don't mean by that in being critical, I mean by that examining it analytically. And when I do that kind of work, it's because I believe the Bible is written with such precision that we can be guided to what it's saying if we pay attention to exactly what it's saying. What a concept. Uh, so that's the work we do, and it's important for you to understand that many of the more profound insights that I'm going to lay out for you, ones that are shaking up a lot of people's eschatology only because they just hadn't thought it through, they hadn't paid attention, comes from, thus saith the Lord. The Lord said this. Because he said this, the only conclusion we are compelled to accept is, is this over here. So anyway, believing the Bible written by God was written with perfect precision. That's a key thing. And then all the other things we said also, it's inspired, it's inerrant, it's preserved. We have it today. It's available to us. Finally, believing the Bible provides everything necessary for a correct interpretation of it. That's another critical matter. A lot of people depend on outside sources to interpret the Bible. That's a mistake. I think outside sources can be helpful in many ways, but not in interpretation, maybe in illumination, perhaps in elaboration, stuff like this, but not in interpretation. We find out what it's saying first and then look around for whatever else might be out there to testify to this or that or to bring out this or that or whatever. So history does not interpret prophecy. Prophecy interprets history. And you're going to be amazed when we look at Daniel 11 and I bring to your attention some of the unfortunate mistakes that have been made because students of the scripture decided that they were going to interpret a passage according to what this history book says. It creates problems for all kinds of reasons, beginning with the fact that the history book writers are not inspired. So we end up subordinating the inspired record to the interpretations that are built and premised upon the uninspired record. It's a mistake. I can't wait to get there almost. Maybe we'll go there today. No, we won't. But in chapter 11, it's just amazing, you know, how they miss certain things. In other words, when you're looking at history, don't expect a secular, godless historian to be concerned about bringing to light historical anecdotes that show fulfillment of prophecy. They're not going to do that. They're not interested in that. They're not looking for those anecdotes. So if you're limiting yourself to the, what the history people decided is important, then you can miss historical anecdotes that are in record, but they're just not brought out because the historian writing that book wasn't interested in it. And I'm going to show you three or four occasions where Believing, you know, like an archaeologist who looks at the Bible and says, well, the Bible says this, this, and this. I'm going to therefore go and look for this artifact in this area. And they find them, don't they? That's on and over and over and over again. Well, imagine that same principle being applied to history. Well, Daniel said this would happen. Let's go look for an anecdote in history that fits that. Shocking. It's there. With precision again. Not just, a, this is a close match, but precision. And we'll get into that. You'll, you'll appreciate it, I'm sure. <clears throat> so, again, four things you need to know. The third one is this. This is a Bible study. And by Bible study, I mean that we're not 
I'm not offering you uh, an examination of Clarence Larkin's eschatology. We're not studying. Our textbook is not Things to Come by Dwight Pentecost. Those are good books. There's a lot of great insight into prophecy to be culled from both of those books. Or one of my favorites, um, Mr. Peter's four-volume work on, on the kingdom of God, the Theocratic kingdom. It's an awesome piece of work. Oh, my soul, that man uh, it's been a whole lifetime in assembling all the scriptures related to the kingdom and sorting them all out and organizing them. It's just an amazing piece of work. But that's not what we're doing. I have read those books. They have taught. I have learned things from those, those authors. But only what I've verified by Bible do I bring into our study here. But the point I want to make right now is that what we're studying is the Bible. Okay? We want to know what the Bible says about these things, not what men have said. So let's keep that in mind. And then understand that speculation is sometimes necessary and even, well, warranted. And by speculation, I mean that you see some things that the prophets say, and then from what they say, you kind of decide, well, it looks like it's going to happen this way or that way. Okay? And it's through prophetic speculation that a lot of prophecy students have gotten themselves in a great deal of trouble because they've swerved off into careless speculation. But I just said speculation is sometimes necessary. When, for example, I say, we look at Daniel's visions of the four beasts. We see this lion that rises up out of the sea, and it has wings of an eagle and, and all that. And, uh, and then it, the, the, the eagle's wings are plucked, and it stands on its back legs, and it receives the heart of a man, and that's quite an image. Now, Daniel does not go forward to say the eagle's wings represent America. He doesn't say that. Daniel does not go forward to say what's going to happen is the country of Iraq is going to come under a time of great, uh, the, the burden of great oppression for many, many centuries. And then there's going to be a, an amazing transformation from a beast-like civilization to a more humane-like civilization. None of that is said by Daniel. Those things are speculation. But they're closely connected to the text. The difference will be this in this class. It will be held to a minimum, first of all. And then any time it's engaged in, it will be honestly attested. Or in other words, I'll say, this is speculation. Say what I mean. And I'll always, make a very, I'll always be very careful to, to differentiate when I'm offering what I think, how I think this is going to happen as opposed to what the Bible says is going to happen. Amen, class? Fair enough? Okay. All right. Now, the reason the prophecies are given is so that we could discern the time we live in. So there has to be an application. There has to be a moment in history where somebody's going to look at that prophecy and go, it's being fulfilled. That's going to happen. Right? We just don't know exactly when <laughs> some of these things are going to happen or exactly how they're going to happen. And while we, know we do not engage in sensationalism, much of what we will learn is sensational. And that's especially true when we consider the interpretation between Daniel's predictions and modern events. Okay, now there's one person you need to know as we proceed in our study. And that person is our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how they got an advanced photo of him coming again on the white horse. Obviously, this is an artist's rendition of the coming of Christ on the white horse uh, and as it's represented in Revelation chapter 19. But uh, you need to know him. And in order to know him, you must confess with your mouth that he is the Lord. You must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And you must call upon his name, asking him to save you and to forgive you of all your sins. If you haven't done that, you need to do that. And it's not hard to do. The Bible says Jesus told us to go out and preach repentance and remission of sins. Let me take just a moment to explain those two words. We'll have a moment of prayer and then we'll proceed with our lesson. The Bible says to repent. What does that mean? The word repent essentially means to turn around. Now, a lot of people make, a, make much of the fact that it's a translation of a word metanoia, which means change of mind and so on. The problem with that is some people uh, have a tendency to take 
something like that and run with it and build an entire theology on a dictionary definition of a word. That's a mistake. Words ha- take on their meaning within the context where they're used. You got to interpret it and understand it within the context of its use. And so when you look at the Bible, when you read the word repent, it's, it's explained in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And it's a, uh, and, and in Acts chapter 20, the Apostle Paul explained it. It's turning from darkness to light. It's turning from the power of Satan to the power of God. It's turning from sin to his righteousness. Not to righteousness in the sense of, now I'm going to start being good. But to righteousness in the sense of, I don't have any, I turn to you, I submit to yours. That's exactly what this means. So repentance means to turn from sin and even from your own righteousnesses, which are as filthy rags. You know, most people measure themselves by their own idea of what's right and wrong. But when you're judged by God, you're not going to be measured by. He's not going to say, okay, give me your list of rights and wrongs. Let's see how you did. He's going to judge you by what he told you was right and wrong in the Bible. That's how you'll be judged. And so how you measure up to his word is the issue, not how you measure up to yourself or to others. You might be as good as I am and better. You might be as good as anybody you know and better. You could even be as good as Job, Daniel, and Noah who are the three most righteous men that ever lived outside of Jesus Christ. But that righteousness won't save you because all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So repentance is typically understood to mean turning from your dark and wicked sins. It does mean that. But it also means turn from your own idea of righteousness because your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You need to turn around and recognize that you're doomed and without hope outside of Christ. You need to humble yourself to him and be saved. So this change of mind thing means there needs to be a change, not only of the superficial thoughts and whims and so on and notions of the mind, but the thoughts of the heart. You must obey from the heart that form of doctrine given to you, which is this. Jesus died for your sins. He was buried. On the third day, he rose again, conquering death and conquering sin. And purchasing for you, by his death, purchasing for you the free gift of eternal life. And we come to remission, payment. Jesus paid it all. All you need to do is receive the free gift. You repent, turn to God. When you do, with a humble heart, he extends his mercy. And he offers you a free gift. And the free gift that he offers you is eternal life life and you receive the free gift of eternal life like you receive any gift you simply take it you accept it that's where faith comes in you must believe that he does what he promised to do he said if you confess with your mouth the lord jesus and believe in your heart god raised him from the dead calling on his name he says you shall be saved didn't say you might be he said you shall be So remission is when you accept as true what God promised he would do. See that? So let's have just a moment of prayer. Let's bow our head before the Lord right now and pray. And if you have not met the Lord in this way, if you have not received Christ as your Savior, do that in your heart right now by simply praying, Jesus, I confess you as Lord. I believe you rose again. I call on your name to save me and forgive me. Well, amen. Now, if you did that, then you're saved. If you didn't do that, but you need to do that, and you have some questions about it, you're a little puzzled, then by all means, see me before you leave today. Let's make sure we have a conversation about that and clarify some things for you. But if you did what I just instructed you to do from the Bible, according to the Bible, you're saved. Not according to me, not according to the Baptist Church, not according to any religion, but according to God's Word. You're born again. You're saved. And we can talk more about that later on. But you need to know Him because you know what? He's the revelator. 
He is the one that reveals to our heart the truth of his word. Let's go ahead and be introduced now to Daniel. So open your Bible to the book of Daniel and look at chapter number one. We looked at chapter 4, 17 a moment ago. We'll look at chapter number one now in the book of Daniel. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And it goes on to give the record of Daniel's introduction to us and the introduction of his book. It's a great read. I encourage you to take the two weeks between now and when we start our study of the content of the book of Daniel to read through the book of Daniel. I'm going on a vacation. (sighs) Vacations are very tiresome. I think, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Yes, amen. So I got an amen over here in this corner. Uh, So anyway, but we're going to be gone for two weeks. And I've never done that before since we've been here anyway that I can remember. I don't think so. It's been so long. We haven't taken a vacation, I don't know, at least 60 years. I don't know. I'm just kidding around. But it's been a long, long time. Since we've done anything like that, the church is so gracious. Thank you so much, church, for your kindness to us to give us the funds we need to do this. And then Emily stepped in as the uh, trip organizer, whatever you call her, the travel agent, and organized everything. It was just very, very nice. Praise the Lord. I'm very blessed. Uh, such a loving church. And so we thank God for that. So uh, when I tease about, you know, this, don't think I'm not grateful. I am deeply grateful. So we're looking forward. But I'll be gone for two weeks And then when we get back, we'll continue with our study. This is an introduction to the course and then an introduction to Daniel himself and to the characters, the main characters in the book of Daniel. And then we'll pick it up uh, when I get back. Here are some questions we're going to be looking at as we proceed this morning. Um, God named Daniel with those two other men whose righteousness was noteworthy. Who are they? I already mentioned them. They are Noah and Job. And they're named as the three most righteous men. These three men are the only men who could save themselves from the judgment of God at the time that God was bringing judgment on Judah because of her sin. And so that's the context in which that was said. How old was Daniel when he was taken into Babylon? He was between 16. Some have put it as old as 20. Some say as young as 14. So it bounces around a little bit. I'll give you the arguments on why I've concluded as I have. What prophet likely had the greatest influence in Daniel's young life? Most likely Jeremiah. It's, it's, very, it's uh, very probable that Daniel actually sat under the preaching of Jeremiah when he was a, a young boy uh, through his teen years. What date did the teacher give for Josiah's death? I believe that Josiah died in 608 B.C. I'll explain to you why and why that's important later on. According to your text, when did Jeremiah the prophet declare the kingdoms of the world had been turned over to Nebuchadnezzar, whom God called his servant? Same year, 608 B.C., in the year that Josiah died. What is the most famous event that occurred during Daniel's earthly ministry, or early ministry, I'm sorry, in Babylon under King Nebuchadnezzar? Well, we believe that was his interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but some would argue it's the interpretation of his second dream when he would be sent out to pasture, that is, Nebuchadnezzar would be sent out to pasture to eat grass with the cows till he came to his senses. But I would say it's Daniel 2, his interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's image dream. How long was it before Daniel interpreted the second most famous dream of Nebuchadnezzar's? About 25 years. Who was the next king to rule in Babylon after Nebuchadnezzar died that is named in the Bible? Well, it's the evil Morodach. What a name. I mean, how sad is it to be called evil? But the word doesn't mean what we take it to mean as it's used there. It's just a transliteration of the Hebrew word. We'll get into that later on. But a guy named Evel Merodach is the fellow who followed Nebuchadnezzar, who's named in the Bible. Now, later, when we look at that more closely, it's interesting that transition period from Nebuchadnezzar all the way over to Belshazzar, because most people would answer Belshazzar. That's what you would think if you read the book of Daniel. But if you go to Jeremiah, you'll find out there was another king that came in after Nebuchadnezzar 
who was there before Belshazzar. So when we study all that out, you'll find an interesting bonus, an introduction to the characters in Daniel's drama, which is what we look at today. Let's go ahead and get busy with that work. Daniel, he's the first one we're going to meet. He was an extraordinary man. He was named among the three men God said were the only men whose righteousness could have saved them and themselves only from the judgment that God declared against Judah. These men are Noah, Job, and Daniel. And you can see that, by the way, in Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14 and verse 20. Now, these men were regarded with honor according to the angel that God sent to reveal the future to Daniel. Daniel was most beloved and greatly beloved. You'll see that said three times by Gabriel to Daniel. Let's look at them. Daniel 9, verse 23. Where it says, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, we'll be looking at this very carefully, of course, later. And the vision referenced here, actually, is a vision Daniel received that's recorded in the chapter prior, chapter 8. And we'll look at all that later on. What I want you to see right now is that the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, you are greatly beloved. Hmm. Look at Daniel 10, verse 11. You'll see it again. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Well, he wasn't very beloved by the magicians and astrologers and so on of his day, was he? He wasn't beloved by the wise men of Babylon. So when it says, O Daniel, greatly beloved, who's beloving him? Gabriel said in another place that I am among those who stand before God. Gabriel is one of those high-ranking archangels, one of three, that actually stand before God. And so in the presence of God, it's like anybody else who's in the presence of some great leader. They get to hear things. They get to overhear things, don't they? And no doubt Gabriel overheard God more than once express his special appreciation for Daniel. And we'll look more carefully at it later, but Daniel was greatly beloved. So the angel, it, I, I, I'm going to reflect on this just for a moment longer because it, it is interesting and you'll miss it if you're not paying attention. Gabriel didn't say, I was sent here with a message to tell you that you're greatly beloved. Did he? He comes to Daniel and says, O oh man, greatly beloved. The Lord told me to tell you, and he tells him all the things God, but God didn't say, go tell Daniel he's greatly beloved. And the reason I bring that out is because it, it, it brings out this scenario where Gabriel knows God really likes this one. <laughs> and so when Gabriel came to meet him, he says, you're, you're, you're some, I've heard about you. You've been mentioned more than once in my presence while I was there at the Father's throne. Daniel, a man greatly beloved. Daniel chapter 10, verse 19, it said again a third time. And he said, O man greatly beloved, fear not, peace be unto you, and so on. And then Daniel had some friends. They're known, unfortunately, by their Chaldean names, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. That's sad. It is interesting. Daniel was given another name too, Belteshazzar. So he was named after Nebuchadnezzar's God. He was called Belteshazzar. He liked Daniel better. And so that's the name that, as it were, that God gave him or his family gave him. And so he was consistently referred to as Daniel. He's almost never referred to. In fact, nobody ever calls him Belteshazzar that I can think of right now. Nebuchadnezzar might have. But he's always referred to as Daniel. However, Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah are only called by their Jewish names in the first chapter of Daniel. From then on, anytime they're mentioned, they are referred to as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, somebody said that they believe this suggests they adapted to their Chaldean name, that they became more Chaldean than Daniel did, that they sort of were willing to give up their Jewish identity and Jewish heritage. I personally think that's saying a little too much. That goes into the category of speculation, and I think it goes a little too far, but I don't know.
All I know is, according to Daniel, we never hear them referred to by their Hebrew names again. It might suggest something along those lines, but we don't have any other thing to corroborate that. In other, in other words, what we do find out is those three stood by Daniel throughout. They were appointed to high positions of honor by Daniel. And they were, so they were elevated by Daniel to high positions in the kingdom. And when Nebuchadnezzar rebelled against Daniel's interpretation of his dream, some, most of you know enough about this to know Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, gold head, silver torso, brass belly, thighs, iron legs, iron mixed with clay feet, iron mixed with clay toes, right? You know that vision. Not long after that, Nebuchadnezzar got prideful and he built an image all gold. And there's no question in my mind, he was repudiating Daniel's prophecy that his kingdom would deteriorate until finally it would be destroyed. When that happened, he asked, or he required everybody to bow down to it. Where was Daniel? That's always asked. I don't know. He didn't tell me. So I don't know where Daniel was. We can speculate there are times he went to Shushan the palace, which is over in the area we now call Iran. He might have been who knows where. We don't know. It might even have been the case that as far as Daniel was concerned, the king was able to give him a, willing to give him a pass. That's what some suggest. Could be. I don't know. But these three, the Bible says, stood up and would not bow to the image. They were thrown into the fire. And God looked at them, at them and said, you compromisers who gave up your Jewish heritage and name, pfft, I'm going to burn you. No, <laughs> that's not what happened. Jim's going, what? <laughs> no, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the Son of God, showed up in that fire and stood with them. So, uh, you know, the jury's still out on whether or not, on why. Uh, they are not known by their Hebrew names after chapter one, but I'm not sure I'm comfortable saying that they were compromisers. It could be, I suppose. But this is a, a depiction. Uh, again, I don't know who got these pictures. It's so awesome, though, that we have these photographs from so far ago. But here's a, an artist's rendition of this golden image that was set up, and everybody required to bow to it. And, of course, here are our three. This is an artist's rendition of, I don't know who described their faces to the artist. You know how they do in these crime shows? They, they draw a picture from your memory of what you saw. I'm not sure who sat down and gave the artist this information, but here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Azariah, Hananiah, and uh, Mishael. And uh, here they are again. Now they're in the fire. They don't seem to be in too much trouble. <laughs> they seem to be doing well in the fire. And uh, here they're praising God because guess who showed up? The Son of God showed up, amen. And we know that their bands were burnt off, their, their bonds were burnt off, but otherwise they were not singed. Not even, the clothes weren't even singed. That's just an awesome story. And it's, of course, the story that they are particularly famous for. And then there's Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. I'll quit teasing about who got this picture and all that. All right? Anyway, you, so you know these are just artist renditions, of course. And so that's Onibu. And that's when he decided to go out and eat grass. <laughs> wow. Can you, can you imagine? That's, that's, that's in Daniel chapter 4. And then I'm, I don't know if that's what he looked like. Can you, isn't that terrible? Yikes. It's disgusting. Anyway. And then there's old Belshazzar. And by the way, Nebuchadnezzar is an interesting personality. We're going to speak a lot about him uh, later. We'll talk about how God calls him my servant, how God elevated him to be ruler over the whole world, how God put even the fowl of the air under his command and under his power. It's amazing when we look at that. And yet this guy was a heathen. And so it's just very interesting. But uh, I, and there's, there's some insight in that that's very helpful to us to understand rightly this historical transition from the time that Israel held the kingdom to it being removed from Israel and put into the hands of the Gentiles. And the first of the Gentile nations to hold it was this man, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon. Well, now we come to the end of Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar died earlier. He died in about, about 43 years after 
Uh, we come from Daniel chapter 1. About 43 years later, Nebuchadnezzar is gone. There's a period of transition there uh, that's very interesting. You get into the history of that. It's a wonderful how the biblical record uh, stands under all this confusion that goes on in the history books. And how if people would just pay attention to what the Bible's saying, it would help them sort out all this crazy stuff that goes on in, in the history books. A lot of these historians would write in order to support this or that king or this or that ruler or and stuff like this went on. You know, hist history revisionism is not new. Did you know that? We deal with it today and we're frustrated with it, but it's not new. It's been going on for a very long time. And we'll show evidence of that later on. But when you take the biblical record, as we will do, and through the insights and light, in the light of the biblical record, examine then the historical record, it all comes together. It's just, it's just amazing. But uh, we'll do that work later on. We come finally to Belshazzar. He's the last one to sit on his grandfather's throne. Belshazzar was a grandson to Nebuchadnezzar. Let me show you why we think so. Belshazzar identifies himself as the second ruler in the kingdom. By second, that doesn't mean chronologically, Nebuchadnezzar was the first, Belshazzar was the second. What that means is in terms of rank. And we know that because in Daniel 5, 7, he says to Daniel, I'm going to make you the third ruler of Babylon. So why would Belshazzar make Daniel the third ruler unless he couldn't make him the second one because he was the second one. <laughs> so I'm going to give you the history of that just in a nutshell here. What happens is after we go through this battle with Labse, Marduk, and all these different names that come up in the, in the Babylonian Chronicles and all that kind of stuff, when we sort through all that stuff, that big mess, what you wind up with is that Nab Nabonidus, who was a top general under Nebuchadnezzar, who married Kasaya or Kaseya, which is Nebuchadnezzar's daughter, ends up being given the kingdom. They vote him in, as it were. The powers that be put him on the throne. He has a son with Kaseya, whose name is Belshazzar. While Nabonidus has gone north to fight, interestingly enough, Cyrus, because Cyrus was rising up in power in the north, in modern-day Iran, back then Persia, who had leagued with a fellow named Gubaro, whose name also is Darius, or Darius. And they got together. Boy, that story is fascinating, but we'll look at that in just a minute. But when they got together, the empire began to build and to grow and began to usurp territory governed by Babylon in the northern area. So Nabonidus takes the Babylonian army, most of it, and he goes north to fight with the prince. Well, I'm going to give something away there, but to fight with Cyrus. And as they're fighting, Darius brings his army down to Babylon. So Nabonidus has taken the heart of the army out of Babylon. He's up there in, in, in uh, Iran, really getting his lunch fed to him. He's losing big time. And the reason they would put a son, an heir, on the throne when they went to battle is in case they got killed. The kingdom would continue on. Now, Nabonidus has been fighting up in there for 10 years. Yeah, and during that time, Belshazzar is on the throne. And it's during the time that Belshazzar is on the throne that Daniel has his visions. Now, he interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2 and chapter 4 but has no visions until after Nebuchadnezzar is gone. And while Nabonidus is up there fighting Cyrus, Daniel is getting these visions in the first year of Belshazzar and in the third year of Belshazzar. In the first year, he gets the vision of the beasts, the visions of the beasts, I should say. In the third year, he gets the vision of the ram and the he-goat and all that kind of stuff. It's all very fascinating, but we'll get into that again when we get there. But just to kind of give you some sense of all this, Belshazzar, the second ruler of the kingdom, grandson to Nebuchadnezzar, uh, who's called his father, but evil Morodach, as I already mentioned, uh, is named in the Bible as successor to Nebuchadnezzar. I have mentioned turmoil, the success, I kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Daniel received most of his visions while Belshazzar sat in his grandfather's throne. 
And then finally, we have that many, many tackle you farson, right? The handwriting's on the wall. Um, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. And then God brings destruction. And here's the fellow that God used to bring it, Darius the Mede. He and Cyrus are joined together. Their, com their combined empires are called Medo-Persia or the Medo-Persian Empire. And Darius was the king of the Medes. Cyrus was the king of the Persians. At this time in history, Cyrus is already the greater of the two, and the kingdom is actually under his influence and, and control. And so Cyrus appoints Darius to be the king in Babylon. That's why we're told Darius was made king in Babylon. He was made the king. Who made him the king? Cyrus did. So they conquered all of this, and then Darius became the, the leader there. Darius is most famous for uh, his part in the story of Daniel in the lion's den. In Daniel chapter number 6, you know the story. The wise men conspired to catch Daniel in a, in a crime. So they had to create a crime they knew he'd commit. <laughs> that goes on today in California and elsewhere. They make laws that trap you, you know. But anyway, uh, that's what they did. And they came to the king and said, make a law that nobody can ask of any god anything except from you. So the king, perhaps flattered or whatever, he foolish, he signs this thing and puts his ring and print on it and all that. And so it becomes a law of the Persians, the law of the Medes and the Persians, which altereth not, and you can't change it. And so the penalty for asking of any god, any petition, other than from the king, Darius, was to be thrown into the lion's den. Well, Daniel, of course, went to his window and prayed three times, right, a day, all right? He, he did not miss a step in his devotions, and he prayed right out in the open. He didn't change his, any way, so he was thrown in the lion's den. There he is, sitting in the lion's den. And, of course, you know the story, and we'll be going into that story in more detail later on, but uh, Daniel received the prophecy of the 70 weeks during the reign of this king, during the reign of Darius. Now, he received the vision of the beasts, visions, I keep doing that, the visions of the beasts. And uh, in Belshazzar's first year, he receives the vision of the transfer of the kingdom from Babylon to Persia in the third year of Belshazzar, about seven years before it was fulfilled. It's very interesting. So he receives that during the time of Belshazzar. When we come to the end of Belshazzar, many, many tackle you farce and all that, Belshazzar is wiped out. His knees smoke together. And all that happened. That's beautiful. Very interesting. Darius comes in, takes over. Darius becomes the king. And now, at that time, Daniel's studying the Bible. He reads in Jeremiah about the 70 years. Desolation. He calculates it. Ah, it's over. And so he's praying in Daniel 9. And the angel comes to visit him. And Daniel 9 is where he gets the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And the 70 weeks prophecy, as we will show, is an explanation of the vision he received in Daniel 8. And we'll explain all that later on. So, amen. Now we got Cyrus. Looks just like him. <laughs> Cyrus was mentioned by name. In Isaiah's prophecy, 100 years before he was born. Yeah, isn't that something? You'll read that in Isaiah 44, verse 28, and in Isaiah 45, verse 1. In fact, from 44, 28, that's the end of that chapter. 45, 1 is the beginning of chapter 45. So at the end of 48, the beginning of 45, you've got Cyrus. And the prophecy is so fascinating because it says that Cyrus, my shepherd, He's going to say unto Jerusalem, be built. And that he would live in the days that the temple's foundation was laid. That's weird because that prophecy is at a time when people would read that and blink twice and go, what's he talking about? The temple's right over there. I mean, you could literally be sitting there with Isaiah's prophecy, Isaiah 48, 25 and 45, 1 in your lap, right in front of the temple, Solomon's temple. You could be reading it and you read that, and you go, what? And you look up at the temple right there in front of your eyes. So what would you conclude? You'd probably say, 
whoo, that temple's going to be destroyed. Right? Then that's speculation, wouldn't it? That'd be speculation back then. We have history to show that's what happened. But I'm setting you up to understand how we do this work. Imagine yourself sitting there in front of the tavern, in front of the temple after Isaiah had written this or hearing him preach it maybe at the temple and he's preaching the sermon and you're going, what is he saying? And you go, for, you go home to talk about the message. And as you talk about it, you go, boy, I tell you, these prophets, I know this is a man of God. I know this is from the Lord. If, if there's going to be a man named Cyrus who's going to declare the foundation to be laid, it must mean that the foundation is going to be taken down. If he says he's going to build Jerusalem, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. So we will be doing some of that kind of work also. We'll read certain prophecies and we'll go, hmm, here's what this could mean. And so in Cyrus' case, 100 years before he was born, his story is fascinating, by the way. Darius the Mede was his uncle. And together they conquered Darius' brother, the cruel Estheages, who was king of Medea or Media. They combined their empires. When we get into that story, it's going to, you don't want to, you don't want to hear that story just before you have lunch. It's really a gruesome story of how this Astyages required one of his generals to eat the corpse of his own son. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry I brought it up now. Ruin you. Ruin your lunch. But you'll have a little while to get over and get ready. But it's true. It's just an amazing piece of history. And, and we'll show how Cyrus was hidden. And how many myths and stories we read, like uh, Snow White being hidden among the dwarves and all these, a lot of these stories actually are spins, are spinoffs from biblical stories. It's interesting. So in the third year of Cyrus, Daniel received the glorious vision of Christ and the prophetic history from Persia to the time of the end. So in Daniel's, Daniel chapters 10 through 12, we'll go into that. That was revealed to Daniel in the third year of this king, Cyrus. We're almost done. Hang on. Now the angels in our story. These, those were the men of our story, the book of Daniel. Now the angels. And the first, the most prominent, is the angel Gabriel. Once again, it's an artist's rendition. We have no idea. I wonder if Gabriel looks at some of this and goes, especially in that one. Okay, but anyway, Gabriel is the angel that God sent to reveal the future to Daniel and his name, Gabriel. He is one of three chief princes. The three chief princes of God's angelic host are these, Michael, Gabriel, and here's a surprise, Lucifer. And you can read about that, Daniel 8, 16, 9, 21, so on. And we will go into, the, into it in some more detail when we get back to the... This is just an introduction. We're just kind of touch and go on some of these things. We come back and fill in the blanks later on. This is the angel God used to announce the birth of John the Baptist to his father, Zacharias. This is the angel God sent to announce the birth of Christ to Mary. Very interesting. Why didn't he send Michael to announce the birth of the king? of the Jews. Michael is, according to the Bible, Daniel's prince or the prince of Daniel's people. But he sent Gabriel instead. We'll be looking at that. This is a picture of, of uh, Michael the archangel. No one, so far as I know, has seen him except, you know, Daniel and some of these others. But Michael is called the chief prince and he's called prince of Thy people, or Daniel's people, in Daniel 10, 13, and 12, 1. We know from the Bible that Michael is the great angel that stood up against Moses when Moses tried to take, Mo uh, I can't Moses, excuse me. Michael is the great prince that stood up against Lucifer or Satan when Satan tried to take Moses' body there. Got that right. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that fascinating? Read, read about that in Jude verse 9. It's hard to visualize some of this. You know, Moses dies, and then they're having an argument of who gets the body. And Satan showed up, wanted to grab that body and use it. What did he have in mind? 
I can give you some biblical based answers for that, but we're going to save it for later. OK. All right. So they have this dispute between them. And Michael, the point of Jude is that Michael didn't even dare. Bring a railing accusation against this powerful prince. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. And the point of Jude is that illustrates deference to the powers that God appointed. And so we'll get into that some more later on. And what it points out is that this creature, Satan, is extremely powerful. He was called to assist Gabriel when confronting the prince of Persia. Now, we have all kinds of good reasons to conclude, as we do conclude, that this reference to the prince of Persia is talking about the demon power behind him, and that demon power was Satan himself. Satan was indicated as a prince of Persia. Now, it gets really fascinating when we talk about how these angels war with each other over territorial jurisdiction. And Satan had, had succeeded at claiming territorial jurisdiction over Persia. And so he was prince over Persia. And when Gabriel was sent to bring an answer to Daniel, an answer to his prayers, the Bible says that this prince of Persia stood up to stop him. And what was Gabriel going to tell Daniel? Gabriel was coming to tell Daniel that when the king of Persia, Cyrus, declares the decree to go and rebuild Jerusalem, from that point on, the prophecy begins to unfold that goes to the coming of Christ. That, it's interesting, isn't it? And Gabriel doesn't, I mean, the prince of Persia did not want Gabriel to get that message to Daniel. He wanted to stop it. And he also wants to stop me from telling you the things I'm going to be telling you. But with your prayers, it won't happen. We're going to bring it all out. But that's what's going on in the heavenlies. This amazing warfare is happening. Well, the Bible says that Gabriel couldn't deal with this guy. For 21 days, he kept trying to get around him and he couldn't get past him. So Michael had to be called to come and help. They had to double team Lucifer to overcome him. What does that tell you? He is a very powerful being. And he is one of the three, one of the three big ones. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer. Michael will finally defeat Satan. That's what makes Revelation 12, 1 so particularly interesting when you bring this background with you and you read Revelation 12 1 then you appreciate how significant it is that in heaven finally Michael overcomes Satan and chains him and binds him in the bottomless pit so that's quite a story right there and I'm running hard against my time this is the third one Lucifer we're done Lucifer was cast out of heaven because of his pride and because iniquity was found in him and that's recorded in Ezekiel chapter 28 and in Isaiah chapter 14, passages we would look at. I use this one because uh, he identifies himself at this time in history as Prince of Persia. So you know, there he is, kind of Persian looking. I wonder what the angels think of these pictures and stuff, you know what I mean? But Lucifer is the arch enemy of God. He was the covering cherub, according to the Bible, but was cast down because iniquity was found in him, Ezekiel 28, 12 to 15. Gabriel refers to him as the prince of Persia, as I mentioned. Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer are the three archangels, and it appears each has one-third of the heavenly host under his command. That's a speculation. It's derived from some things the Bible says. When Satan drew one-third of the angelic host with him when he was cast out, it suggests he had those angels under his power, which suggests that these three archangels have one-third of the heavenly host under their jurisdiction. And then finally, however, he's going to be cast into the bottomless pit. And that's what it looks like from inside, looking up out. I don't know who has that perspective. Not me. So I had to borrow this from an artist who apparently is going to go there. I'm just kidding around. I'm just goofing around. I shouldn't. Then we have the last days, and we'll be looking at these things. There are 
five or four, excuse me, major prophetic eras into which prophecy is divided. And they are the last days, the days of wrath upon this people. That represents the rapture. And then there's the rise of Little Horn and the initiation of the last end of the indignation. And that comes the, uh, comes, uh, the man of sin who makes a confirmation with the covenant with Israel. Then you have what's called the 70th week and then finally the unprecedented tribulation. So there are five, actually, five historic prophet, prophetic periods into which all of prophecy falls. So some scriptures have to do with the last days, some with days of wrath, some with last end, some with 70th week, some with the unprecedented tribulation and so on. And we'll get into all that later. There's also, of course, after that, the millennial reign. And we'll be talking about that. And one little thing that I'll throw out right now, just to kind of uh, whet your appetite for this study and to encourage you to realize that there are some things you're going to learn that's going to help you. Um, A lot of things. But just uh, here's a little tidbit with regard to the millennium. Everybody thinks it's the time of, you know, peace on earth, and all kind of stuff. And, and it is. But Jesus Christ is going to rule the earth with a rod of iron. Okay? There will be sinful people on the earth at that time. And they will be under the rule of Christ. And he'll rule with a rod of iron. Here's something else to know about the millennium. We think of it as a thousand year reign of Christ. That's a mistake. The reign of Christ never ends. The Bible makes that very clear. His, his reign never ends. The millennium is not marked by the beginning and ending of Christ's reign. It's marked by this. Satan is put into the bottomless pit at the beginning. He's released from the bottomless pit at the end. It's really the millennial binding of Satan is literally what the millennial is. But more on that later on. And there's a lot more. Let's stand together.